There have been rumors of a market flash crash or a black swan event coming in soon as markets continue to trade lower and globally things are getting kind of crazy. This fear is pronounced even more so on social media eco chambers. There's never ending relentless onslaughts of bearish news but if you want to succeed as a crypto investor you have to learn how to block out the noise instead of paying attention to all of the crap that's constantly streaming online you have to pay attention to your charts the facts your intuition and work not to be swayed by emotions that are influenced by others and their opinions in this video, we'll be talking about global events virtually nobody's actually paying attention to that may cause markets and investors to panic. This is something I would call a sleeping giant. We'll be covering the chart history in TradFi markets like the S&P 500 and the Dow Jones and what they can tell us about what might happen in the future. We'll be talking about crypto investors and how they're currently positioned in the markets. That's quite telling of what's to come over the next few days and week. And finally, I'll be covering my game plan for investing in crypto and XRP. And while although it might feel tempting to be uber bearish, it would actually be wise to take advantage of an opportunity like this. Maybe we do experience a black swan event, a nasty dip or a flash crash. But as the old saying goes, you should be keen to buy when there's blood in the streets. Ultimately, markets adhere to the herd mentality, and you can't make money by following the herd in markets. You must be a contrarian, and you must take advantage of good opportunities when they come, because they come so rarely. Now, before we begin the video, head on over to bullrunners.com. Uh, you can find that on the link down below in the description. And this is a way for you to discover how to earn more crypto in less than 10 minutes per day with the number one play to earn XRP game. So yes, you will be earning crypto. Yes, you will be putting your XRP to work. It's kind of a good way to hedge against any volatility, if you will, because it if things are looking relatively bearish, well, perfect, we got you. If things are looking bullish, even better. You're only going to compound on those gains. Ultimately, this is our all market solution. Doesn't matter if it's a bear or bull, you should head on over to bullrunners.com and we'll get you taken care of. So if you're feeling blessed and bullish, comment 777. And if you're gonna be the richest person in your family tree, smash the subscribe button. Before we dive in, a quick reminder that the opinions in this video are for informational and educational purposes only and do not constitute financial, legal, or investment advice. All investments, including cryptos, carry risks and potential losses. Always do your own research and consult with a licensed financial advisor. We are not licensed financial advisors and relying on our content for financial decisions is at your own risk. By watching this video, you agree we are not responsible for any losses or damages and we do not guarantee any specific results or outcomes. Some of the links below may be affiliate links and we may earn a commission which actually helps support this channel and helps us to create value based videos like this we also hold some positions in the cryptocurrencies that we talk about but that's only because we do what we believe in however this should not be interpreted as a recommendation for you to do the same with that said let's get into the video recently I was listening to a podcast where a gentleman by the name of Stan Weinstein um, is considered a legendary trader, has a lot of institutional clients that listen to what he says and does. Um, and he was even arguing that this last couple of weeks was a very difficult market environment to trade, considering you had some major tech stocks swinging, you know, up and down to the tune of trillions of dollars. Volatility has gotten out of hand. Then you had the whole situation with the BOJ and the yen carry trade. Then you had, you know, a ton of liquidations in the crypto markets on leverage, so on and so forth. And then you're starting to get the S&P 500 and the Dow Jones trading 
breaking lower to the point where they're breaking below their 50 EMAs and arguably into that range where now we're looking at the 200 EMA as a final stand or last resort support. So that said, I'm going to read portions of this article here saying that Wall Street ends a wild and scary week. After a manic week that began with the Japanese stocks falling to their worst loss since 1987's Black Monday. Think about that for a second. 1987, almost 40 years ago, only for U.S. stocks to soar later to their best day since 2022. Slight gains on Friday carried Wall Street almost exactly back to where it began in the week. It was a vicious return of volatility for a market that had been rising so smoothly. And that's arguably pretty normal for markets. You know, it's one thing when you're you're used to it. If you're in a comfy environment, maybe let's say your household and things have always been a certain way. And then one day you walk there and then a big old picture or uh, uh, you know, a painting that was on your wall is missing or gone. At, at some point in time, you're going to notice that and it's just going to be like standing there and, you know, blare, uh, and staring right back at you. Uh, and so the reality is it's no different in markets. If you're constantly having a smooth market, well, then eventually you're going to have to expect some level of volatility there afterward in the similar uh, you know vein after contraction comes expansion after expansion comes contraction right there are phases to the market just like there are seasons and a measure of fear on Wall Street briefly surged toward its highest level since the 2020 COVID crash it also may not be over worries are still high about the strength of the US economy and reports are due next week on inflation which we got that reading uh, it wasn't great it wasn't bad uh, but the Fed continues to remain according to their own words you know targeted on that 2% inflation goal so that is their target that is where they want inflation to be and so uh, at this point in time everyone's counting in a Fed uh, rate cut and if they don't it's going to hammer the markets the markets are going to collapse or I wouldn't argue collapse but they're going to start to get a bit crazy right because that's what everyone is pricing in and expects that said another report on Thursday will show how many US workers are applying for unemployment benefits and we got that reading it wasn't terrible again it wasn't great but across the board incoming economic data has gotten weaker while inflation has remained more sticky the federal reserve wouldn't have an easy way to fix such a toxic mess the central bank could lower interest rates which would give the u.s economy an upward push but also threaten to worsen inflation and that's really been their fear since day one they don't want a second wave of inflation like they had through the late 70s into the 80s and it could continue to keep its its main interest rate at a two decade high that would put downward pressure on inflation but also inflict more pain on the economy and this is the real problem that they have they have concerns around okay well if we act too late right the economy is going to crash and that's going to force our hands so we're going to have to lower interest rates fast okay usually through the act of an emergency meeting on the flip side if we do too little it's not really going to help anyone out at all now it's not going to send the markets into a frenzy in a panic however we might be too late so we have to find this good middle ground and that's why everyone is pricing in about a 50 basis point rate cut which i would agree i think at this point the markets need that 50 basis points to feel some level of security and how things are being handled from the fed now here we have the S&P 500 basically verifying that there's genuine weakness in the market. I've had this trend line on here for a while. It's respected it, it's remained pretty true. Whether you put it on a logarithmic uh, time scale uh, or a scale I should say, or you put it on a normal scale, ultimately we have broke down below that support. Then from a daily time frame, and this goes back, by the way, to October of 2023. People were like, well, we're going to be in a bull market. We're going to be in a bull. It's like, dude, it's already been a bull market. Many cryptos moved hundreds, if not a thousand percent on some of those insane performers. You've had the S&P 500 pump from 4,000. I don't know, $100 all the way up to $5,600. You had some of the biggest tech stocks and companies in the world putting on trillions. So at the end of the 
day, we were in a bull market. We were remaining above that 10 and 20 EMA. We were typically bouncing off or seeing some level of a, of a move to the upside after we broke back above the 50 EMA. Well, now we are back down and arguably starting to trade below our previous uh, range highs over here in April of 2024, right? Crypto has failed to break out and maybe crypto is a leading indicator. It's telling us a story. It's telling us there's general weakness in the market. So while crypto has failed to move, the S&P 500 and all of the stock market has moved. And now it's time that they start to chill out and potentially drop further. That said, we are officially below the 10 and 20 EMA being sold off there or consistently below this trend line, which should have been a support, broke down heavily and on some serious volume and with some gaps. And now we're seeing a range below the 55 EMA. So although we have been moving to the upside, this looks textbook retrace. This looks textbook dead cat bounce. Uh, and you know, for some people that are day traders, this is a great period of time to trade in terms of volatility. But in terms of buying these range highs, it is far more possible and potential that we make new lows first. So in a weak market environment, if we get any sort of negative news or an event in terms of you know the global stage that could send ripples of fear into the market, you're going to confirm that when the market dumps hard on that type of news. And that's why people have been worried about a black swan event, or in this case, a flash crash. Now, a flash crash can come from a million different vectors. For example, we didn't really think about the Japanese yen carry trade until it happened. And as of recently, we've already thought about and really worked or wrapped our minds around what could potentially happen with a new world war between Russia, Ukraine, and then any one of our allies on on their side or our side uh, getting involved. In the case of Russia, they have an ally in Iran, which is a common enemy to the United States and the West. On the flip side, right, the entire West has mobilized against Russia, but that's not new news. What would be though, is if we had some more terror attacks between the two nations that inflamed things. Now, we've kind of probably already priced that in, but I think the key factor here is Iran. Right now, Hezbollah, okay, is trying to destroy Israel. And recently, Hezbollah has not only promised to enter into war with Israel, they said they don't care if they start a greater war, but they've also started sending missiles to breach the Iron Dome defense. And that is a, a military defense weapon that the U.S. has given to Israel. Uh, and it's worked out very well for them. However, this makes Israel look extremely vulnerable considering it somehow managed to breach the Iron Dome. Uh, it demonstrates that if the Iron Dome is vulnerable to Hezbollah's attacks, it would be even more so against Iran. Rands. And by the way, Hezbollah is a terrorist group over there in Iran. Now, the partnership between Iran and the conflict in the Middle East, and then somehow, you know, Russia being involved in the mix with their weapons of war has probably led us into a position where we also can't back down as the United States, uh, considering, right, we're in a proxy war with Russia. And then on top of that, we've armed and are aiming to defend Israel in this battle. This is a current press release as of August 11th from the Department of Defense saying the Secretary of Defense Lloyd J. Austin III spoke with the Israeli Minister of Defense. Secretary Austin reiterated the United States commitment to take every step possible to defend Israel. Secretary Austin has ordered the USS Abram Link, Abraham Lincoln Carrier Striker Group equipped with F-35C fighters to accelerate its transit to the Central Command Area of Responsibility. He also ordered the USS as Georgia guided missile submarine to the central command region. In other words, why would we be sending all of this stuff over if they weren't getting prepped to not only defend, but potentially wage war? In other words, the U.S. is likely to get involved here. And if there's any more conflict that, you know, creates for higher tensions, any more deaths, uh, it can get to the point where it could potentially not get nuclear per se. That would be insane. But I do believe we could enter a new war, considering now we have common enemies between, again, Iran, 
Russia, and then if you toss China or any BRICS nations into the mix, they might take advantage of their situation around Taiwan. It's literally the perfect storm of opportunity, which leads me to the next major sleeping giant, and that is China and their economy. I think what happened was in 2020, when they really shut things down, they had some draconian measures. Uh, it really hurt their economy. Then in the late 2022, they opened the economy back up and you had economists left and right saying, this is going to save the global world economy because, you know, they're going to start to be productive over there again. And they service so much of the world and they produce so many things. And, uh, you know, China already has such a great great manufacturing industry and all of the stuff that makes China a, a true producer in a global stage. So that said, uh, instead what we got was the fact that the recovery has faltered with sluggish GDP performance, sagging consumer confidence, growing clashes with the West and a collapse in property prices that has caused some of China's largest companies to default. And we're talking banks, by the way, here. We're not just talking real estate companies like Evergrande. In July 2024, Chinese official data revealed that the GDP growth was falling behind the government's target of about 5%. China's sustained real estate crisis and a rapidly aging population have contributed to the speed at which their economy has declined or isn't growing. Beijing industrial policies have led to overinvestment in production facilities in sectors from raw materials to emerging technologies such as batteries, robots, often saddling Chinese cities and firms with huge debt burdens in the process. In other words, China is producing far more output than it or foreign markets can sustainably absorb. And this is putting an extreme amount of pressure and strain, not only on their economy, but on their citizens. And so they're starting to go through a phase where just like in the US at times, right, they're going to have social and civil unrest, they're going to have situations where there's going to be some tremendous downturns, not just in, you know, sectors of the market, but the entire market. So what does this mean for our markets in the US and crypto markets and your XRP? Well, let me dive into some other data to just show how intertwined our economies really are. Now, really quickly, before we move on, head on over to bullrunners.com and subscribe for our all market solution in order to put your XRP to work in the number one play to earn XRP game. This is a very simple way to earn more crypto in less than 10 minutes per day. And it's very, very straightforward and easy. Okay, here's a video of Nick covering exactly how it works and why you should be taking advantage of this right now and again it's going to be three simple steps the first thing you're going to do is you're going to get your xrp wallet the next step is you're going to get your rare in-game pieces and then finally you're going to play the uh play the game in order to earn crypto it really is that simple and yes this crypto is a directly convertible for xrp so at any point in time you're like i want to withdraw my xrp that i've earned from the game you're good to go and these videos explain exactly how you can do that but this is something that Nick and I are very excited to share with you guys because it's a great way to not only reduce the volatility in the case of a downturn in the market, but also a great way to stack onto those XRP bags if we are to enter a bull market through the end of 2024. So one last time, you can find the link in the description below. Go to bullrunners.com. You have nothing to lose, everything to gain. I'll see you on the other side. Now, if you recall, Donald Trump said the word China quite a bit. Now, if you remember, Donald Trump was quite harsh towards China back in his presidency and during that tenure. And the reason was because we were becoming quite dependent uh, and interdependent with the Chinese economy. Uh, and that actually posed some threats in the US economy. So this was back in 2020. And this showed just how dependent we were upon China in about five different charts. Now, many would argue 
that we've become more interdependent on China through the Biden administration, considering he had a lot of lax and easy policies towards them, like removing tariffs and taxes and so on and so forth. But we're just going to cover a bit of the information in this article. Uh, the U.S.-China trade, a large part of the relationship between the U.S. and China, is centered in trade, with two countries having been each other's major trading partner for years. And here is a chart of that. The U.S. recorded a goods trade deficit of $141 billion with China in the first half of 2020. The trading relationship is an, an even one. In merchandise goods trade, the U.S. imports way more from China than it exports to the Asian country. On the flip side, the reverse is seen in the services trade. So it seems we give them more service they give us more goods. But again, that creates an interdependency in our economies. In other words, if one suffers, it's likely the other is going to suffer and vice versa. Um, the reverse is seen in services trade in which China buys more from the US than it sells. And here is that chart. But it doesn't just stop with goods and services. We are also linked at the supply chain level. Beyond direct trade, the US and China have also become increasingly interdependent through rising supply chain linkages over the past decade. And here is the chart for that. Latest available estimates by the OECD showed that in 2015, and this is a little while ago, but imagine if it's in 2015, not including inflation and the global increase in demand uh, for products and services, foreign input accounted for 12.2% or around $2.2 trillion dollars almost a decade ago now by the way of total goods and services consumed in the u.s china was the largest contributing country of that foreign input and i would argue that is probably very much the exact same today and here is the chart for that and finally it doesn't even end there we're talking about investment flows and they have finally started to slow down because i do believe a lot of companies are starting to realize that there is a legitimate flight risk and having too much of your dependent uh, business dependent on the Chinese economy and their workforce. Meanwhile, U.S. investments in China have been relatively more resilient. The ratings agency cited a survey conducted last year by the American Chamber of Commerce in China, in which 83% of respondents said that they are not considering relocating manufacturing or sourcing outside of China. So you can see the risk that is implicated or involved here. When you have a lot of companies saying, you know what, it's far better uh, and far more efficient, or, right, we spent a lot of money and time in China building out the manufacturing for our company and products and services that we are going to sell in the U.S., arguably more products um, than services. And guess what? We are not looking at leaving if, even if, right, the uh, relations between China and the U.S. break down. So what does that mean? That means that if anything really bad happens in China, uh, you know, China is typically going to put their citizens and their companies before ours. And so that might create for us some sort of a situation where we have a breakdown in, in their economy, which will affect ours or vice versa. But ultimately, I think these economies are very interlinked and that can cause a major threat moving forward. This might be that sleeping giant that no one really is talking about right now. And things seem to be happening pretty fast. Back in July 12th of 2024, the Daily Holdo put out an article basically stating that 40 banks shut down in a sudden vanishing act. In the week ending June 24th, 40 banks were sucked up by larger institutions, a vanishing act incomparable even to the savings and loan crisis of the 80s and 90s. The report tracks roughly 3,800 lenders in rural China that hold a whopping 7.5% trillion dollars in assets or 13 percent of the entire banking system that are starting to bleed out due to an overstock of bad loans now why would these bad loans be an issue right whatever you know, there's companies that always fail there's always going to be companies that don't do too well right but i think what this is really stating is that there is underlying weakness in the chinese economy the reason they're having bad loans is because they were lending them out and now all these people are starting to default on them and they can't pay it back and that's usually a sign of a declining economy or weakness in the economy where the average Joe and Jane simply can't afford to pay something back. So they default and it was arguably because of a 
oversight from the bank. In other words, they were handing out loans they probably shouldn't have been handed out because they thought things were better than they actually were. They started loosening or laxing up on their standards for sending out or uh, handing out loans. And for that reason alone, uh, you're just seeing weakness across the board. So it's kind of like a domino effect and things are getting really bad. Um, they said some of them have admitted that as much as 40% of their portfolios are non-performing loans. 36 of the 40 failed institutions were all absorbed into one giant lender. Lyoning Rural Commercial Bank, which was set up by regulators in September to manage bad banks. In other words, it looks like the government is actually having to step in through a major bank that they are behind in order to start to fix this problem that is really underlying weakness in their economy. To finish the article out, at the same time, the Chinese economy has shown multiple signs of hitting a wall in the last year including sharp downturns in residential construction and sales, consumer confidence and consumer prices, combined with a declining population and soaring debt as a percentage of GDP. And as many of you know, right, Elon Musk has been talking about left and right. Our biggest threat over the next upcoming couple of decades is really our declining population worldwide. Now, this is a problem that many people are starting to really take notice of. Someone like Keith McCullough, who's a uh, trader at Hedgeye, said this, China, not that it matters to the permeable's ever-changing narrative, but a big reason why the world is slowing it down right now remains China's quad four recession, down again overnight to new cycle lows. And here's the chart to confirm that. And this general weakness in the market in China and in the US is not only showing up in greater economies, it's also showing up in Bitcoin. As we've seen this descending or megaphone pattern in a downtrend, right? We've seen lower highs, we've seen lower lows, and arguably it is widening. We failed to break above that range at 62,000 now as markets continue to decline over the last couple of days. But I want to look at the perpetual futures market to see if it can't give us clues about when the general bleeding will end, if we will enter a true recession, or whether or not this is a good time to accumulate. So I'm hopping on over to CoinGlass and I'm going to look at the liquidation maps. And this is actually a very telling indicator that kind of gives us a signal we're hanging out at. Uh, in terms of the liquidation maps, I typically like going to the actual exchange liquidation map. I like tossing on Bitcoin because Bitcoin is the largest market in crypto and I do believe it drives the entire crypto space. Then I'm going to take it and toss it on a seven day time frame. And that gives me a relatively good reading about whether or not we have a lot more bears than bulls and vice versa. Now, here this red line is the current price of Bitcoin, about $58,000. On the right hand side, you have all of the leverage on shorts. In other words, these are people that are short the market. And if the market were to hit this range right over here at $64,700, um, then they would be liquidated. On the flip side, if the market hit about $51,800, then these people would be liquidated on the long side. Okay, so really what I'm looking at for or looking for is the depth and the difference. In other words, a lot less people with a lot less money have money in on the long side. Uh, far more people have money on the short side up to $4.6 billion, almost twice the amount over here on the long side. So the general market is leaning short. Now let's see if that actually shows up on the charts. So generally speaking here, if the general market or most of the market has a lot more money on the short side, then you're going to see the price declining. And it does seem to be the case right now, right? Since again, that recent uh, high at 62,000 has been dumping. And to confirm that pattern, this is the open interest from this range low right here in terms of 68,000 contracts, right? We've seen open interest increase and whenever you see price decline while open interest is increasing that means shorts are opening so if anything they're actually piling into the shorts now and they believe the price is likely going to go lower and that would make sense when you actually look 
at the chart, right? Why wouldn't they? When they see weakness and a fail to break out above the $62,000 range, they've seen nothing but lower lows and lower highs and a new major low right here with a stupid amount of volume. If anything, it's easier to bet with the trend, right? The trend is your friend, but again, until the bend at the end. Nobody knows exactly when that end will come, but more often than not, this is exactly what we've seen in most summer in history. Most summers we get a, a summer lull, we get markets continuing to sell off, put some new lower lows in. However, it is a, a new local low in a major uptrend as you can see here. So this has spooked a lot of people out, but if anything, this is it looks more to me like an accumulation range. Whether we break below that 50, I don't know, $53,000 range down to $47,000, uh, doesn't really matter. To me, it seems like an accumulation zone. This is the time that you want to be stacking to those bags. And the reason that I believe that's the case is because companies like BlackRock are extremely bullish. Virtually all of the major your fund managers and the biggest Bitcoin holders are continuing to add to their bags while we see this general market weakness. So they're taking advantage of this risk off summer lull environment and then continuing to rip Bitcoin in mass off exchanges. And at every single opportunity here, as you can see, they've consistently, and this is this purple line here, ripped Bitcoin off exchanges. And that is indicative of bullishness long term. They look at these prices and say, do we believe Bitcoin and you know, crypto as a whole are going to be up uh, 10 years from now, five years from now, far more than where we're currently at. And if the answer is yes, then any amount of sell off, any amount of liquidations, any amount of fear in the market, we are going to buy that. We don't want to buy so much that it creates a, bun a bunch of you know, upward pressure. We just want to take and take all that supply from other people at a discount and then remove it from exchanges. And that's exactly what this indicator is seeing. And now again, we're we're consistently hitting new lows on this indicator of exchange reserves. In other words, there is less Bitcoin today than there was yesterday and the day prior on exchanges. In other words, this is going to create a lot of uh, demand as you know, supply is continually taken off of exchanges. And whenever we get to that point where we're in a bullish environment and people are looking for Bitcoin, again, less Bitcoin, more demand means price go up. And to confirm that thesis, here is the 2024 mid-year global outlook from BlackRock. And in it, they explain how one of the major themes of the year is that they want to lean into risk. That means they're taking more risk while everyone is sitting on the sidelines or capitulating or selling. We think investors should take more risk more deliberately now across multiple dimensions. And if you want to know more about where they're going to be investing and how they're investing, then you can go directly to the BlackRock website and download this report, the 2024 Mid-Year Global Outlook. And one of the areas that they are leaning to in terms of risk this year is Bitcoin. Right here we have Arkham Intelligence and it's showing the actual Bitcoin wallet they had. Back in January 7th of 2024, there was about $10 million in there. And you think about in only eight months how they've added over $22 billion of Bitcoin in a very small period of time. In other words, they are continually adding to their Bitcoin portfolio. So right here, the trend looks up. And again, if I were a betting man, I'd like to bet with the trend. I'd like to bet with the biggest players in the room. The Black Rocks are accumulating while everyone else is capitulating. So what does this mean for XRP? Well, there are a couple of scenarios that could play out, right? There's no, never a single person that knows exactly what's going to happen. And if anyone does tell you that, they are a liar. But I do believe you can lean into a certain direction based on the statistical but I do believe the charts do show us a few things that can help us get a better understanding of what's likely going to happen. So in my opinion, obviously the two scenarios are, or the two potentialities are, we go up or down. And you could say, well, that's not really helpful. But I can tell you kind of about where we would go up to and where we would go down to in both scenarios and what the more likely outcome is. If we continue to see a sell-off through the end of the summer, potentially sometime into October, 
before things recover. Usually we have this end of the year blow off top or an insane move in cryptos when it's already a bullish market. Um, then the reality is we'd see some downside beforehand. And I think the most important targets to hit in terms of XRP, if we did break down, would be somewhere in that 42 cent range and in a very nasty scenario down to the 30 cent range. But this would be kind of a wick buying opportunity. In other words, if I were a betting man and I didn't know whether or not we were going to experience some sort of a black swan event that really liquidates a lot of people before the actual move comes in to the upside, then I would set what I call a stinky bid. Okay. It's a bid that you say, Hey, I'm just going to put it on an exchange with like five, ten thousand dollars, a thousand dollars, wherever you're at in terms of your budget, uh, right here at like 33 cents. And just in case the market crashes, right? And then my bid gets hit. I buy that thing. And then all of these bids start to take uh, effect. And then, you know, the price gets brought right back up into some level of support, maybe at the 38 cent range uh, to 40, you know, two cent range. You never know, but I've seen crazier things happen before, but it seems that we have so much support here and such strong holders that it's unlikely even in a black swan scenario that we would break below the 30 to 28 cent range on a wick before being bought back up. So that would be my stinky bid side. On the flip side, if we break out right now, right, anything under a dollar in my opinion would be an insane buying opportunity. When you look at this descending triangle and wedge that has developed over this period of time, and we're getting very close, right? We're virtually seeing no selling right here at the 54 cent range. And now we're seeing a bit of buying. It is fair to share though, that even if we hit this range one more time, it is possible that we could break down. So I'm not saying that XRP is just ready to break out yet. It doesn't seem like Bitcoin is, but it does seem like it's being accumulated. So at any point in time, if we see general market strength, I think XRP is finally at that last period or last range uh, in order for it to actually make a new all-time high and a breakout above this descending wedge and triangle. Uh, so at any point in time, in my opinion, before the dollar range, stupid good time to accumulate. And where would we go? Well, it's no, you know, it's no secret that we've been in a six and a half year year range, uh, and that it's highly likely we're going to break out to that first that two dollar range. But realistically, that previous all time high that would be my first target. Then it remains to be seen what actually happens there, whether we see a lot of sell pressure there, or whether we break out and have this insane blow off top to some crazy new all time highs. But again, you'll be on the channel watching these videos, uh, and we'll be covering it live. So we'll give you more of our insights and takes by then. Now, finally, if you enjoyed the video, head on over to bullrunners.com in order to discover how to earn more crypto in less than 10 minutes with the number one play to earn XRP game. So in both of those scenarios that we just talked about, whether we go to a new all time high or we break down a bit through the rest of the summer uh, before going to our new all time highs end of year in the bull market doesn't really matter. This is an all market solution. The cool thing is it's going to allow you to hedge against any potential volatility or risk by putting your XRP to work for you to actually earn crypto. And on the flip side, if you're earning crypto and this is the local low, then what's so beautiful is it's a good way to compound and add to those XRP bags. Yes, the crypto itself is actually directly convertible for XRP. And we show you on the other side exactly how that works. So go to bullrunners.com. You can find that in the description below. If you enjoyed the video, subscribe, leave us a like, shoot us a comment. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video, my friend. Goodbye.